going on, fellas? This is Mike D, Mr. Double Down on You, with another episode of Black Fathers Now. Now, check this out, man. This, you know, we're recording this in January, but we're releasing this in February. And I got a brother that is a historian. Like, literally, his life's work is about Black history. History in general, but specifically Black history. Now, he's from Augusta, Georgia. He's one of the brothers of Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, yeah, Rue. All right, all right. He's a um, graduate of South Carolina State University, got his master's from Georgia Southern, but he also did some documentary work to kind of hone his skills in like the oration of history from Duke University. And I have none other than the historian from the Laney Museum in Augusta, Georgia, my frat brother, Corey Rogers. What's up, brother? What's going on, doggy? How you doing? Man, I'm wonderfully well, man. I thank you for taking time out of your schedule, out of what you got going on to share with the brothers the importance of history, Black history, nuances in history, and how that helps us to know who we are so that we can move forward and be the best versions of ourselves. No, thank you for the invitation. I, I, I rarely pass up an invitation to talk about uh, the history of our people, the, the American history, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, you know, our, our people's history has been woven into the fabric of this country since its inception. Mm -hmm. And um, there's some great stories to be told. Uh, I often tell people that, you know, when people are thinking of concepts for movies, oftentimes you don't have to make up anything because history in itself is so fascinating. Yes. And so, um, you know, we as African Americans, you know, we often look back and the only thing we think about is slavery or we mm -hmm. think about Jim Crow. And that those are important elements to our history. But when you look at it in its totality, when you sort of take a step back and look at it from a larger vantage point, uh, there's so many fascinating stories. And I often like to say, that in spite of slavery, in spite of Jim Crow, we've been able to carve out some extraordinary tales of heroism, some extraordinary feats of entrepreneurship. And so um, that's what I like to do. I, I like to talk to people. That's, that's my job. I get paid to talk to others mm. about a history that in many instances has either gone untold been distorted and i'm trying to unravel some of those distortions and fill in those holes that have never been filled mm, man dude and and that's such great work and, and it's interesting because even in the with the emergence of all the smart technology and we can ask alexa for this and get dates and history and all of that there's still a lot of us who really do not understand the full totality of our history. I mean, and we're talking specifically just black history in America, but that's just a snippet of overall history in, in itself, right? I mean, because we can go back to the continent of Africa and creation and this, I mean, we can go, you know, millennia, you know, ago. And there, even though we have all these resources at our disposal, we don't always take advantage of them. Therefore, the need for brothers like yourself who are vocal and who are out there sharing all of this, this information is extremely important. So I thank you for that, brother. Oh, well, well, thank you once again for inviting me and giving me a platform to talk a little bit um, about the, the history of Black America, but more specifically what I do, which is talk about the history of African Americans in Augusta, Georgia. Mm. And, and it's such a fascinating history um, people often talk about the fact that um, they'll, they'll visit Augusta, they'll come here um, from all over the world. And one of the first remarks that I often receive is, I had no idea. Hmm. Now, they might go to Charleston, South Carolina, they might go to Savannah, Georgia, with sort of the mindset of what they're going to see once they get to those cities because of the way the cities have been marketed mm. and because of the resources that those cities have put into preservation and the history and tourism. But when they come to Augusta, they'll often say, wow, I did not know X, mm. Y, and Z. I did not know that Augusta had the oldest this, or I did not know that this particular school started in Augusta. Mm. So um, that's sort of my job, Mike, to sort of 
unravel and unpack these nuggets of mm -hmm. history. Uh, I'll use the term golden, golden nuggets of history because at some point during our exchange today, I'll talk a little bit about what was called the golden blocks of Augusta and how we're trying to revitalize those golden blocks. Mm, powerful, powerful. And dude, I can't wait to get into the nuances of that. Cause you know, I'm, I'm an Augusta native, man. Like I said, you and I go way back, you know, to the notion of you grew up across the street from my grandma. Yeah. <laughs> And, and yes. look, it's even funny, you and I's relationship even started before I got here because you were the ring bearer in my parents' wedding. <laughs> true that, true that. So it's that now that that is funny. And 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 your mother reminds me of that every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that I was the ring bearer in the wedding. <laughs> I have we have photos of that. We do we we have documentation. Yeah, yep. yeah we have documentation of that, but um yeah, I can honestly say on a personal level, um, just the relationship that I've had with your family mm -hmm. has been one of the time-honored relationships that uh, I've been uh, blessed to cultivate throughout the course of my very short life thus far. And, um, you know, just growing up across from uh, Command Sergeant Major Olin Dorsey, mm -hmm. you know, member of the 24th Infantry Regiment, you know, a uh, modern day Buffalo soldier, uh, you know, that, that kind of still gives me sort of goosebumps when I think that I'm living across from a Buffalo soldier for, you know, 30, 40 years. Mm. It, it just brings a smile to my face um, that that I had that connection. And, and you, you know, it's interesting you, you say that because, you know, I remember years ago, you actually formulated in like an article talking about like his, uh, you know, his, um, you know, his accomplishments in the military and all. It was in the Augusta Chronicle. I remember something, you know, that you kind of spearheaded. That's one part. But then I want to throw another thing, which is interesting, again, because we got history. I, you know, I got some deep stories. Your brother, Carl. So, you, you know, you have a younger brother named Carl who both of you all have had this love for history. And Carl actually talked to me a little bit about how the love for history was actually the catalyst which led him to his film career and doing yes. things doing that. And, yes. and it's just like, it's so connected and like, what was like the thing that spawned this love for history for you? Well, I think that there were two different avenues, Mike, that brought me to this point. And as you mentioned before, with my brother, um, one of those avenues sort of intersects with mm -hmm. him. So I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Mm -hmm. But um, for me personally, I've always been fortunate to have some really uh, wonderful educators along the way that introduced me to history or social studies as it may be called in, in elementary school. Um, but going to Terrace Manor Elementary School here in Augusta, uh, I had Miss Paulus in the fifth grade, and then moving to Davidson, um, I, I had um, um, I had Miss uh, Ann Hanley for AP U.S. History and AP European History, uh, Reverend Betty Anderson, who was also my next door neighbor mm -hmm. on Thomas Lane. I had her for World History. Uh, I had Miss Kelly um, for Georgia History in eighth grade. And the way they crafted, the way they taught their craft was so amazing. Mm. And it kind of pulled me in. It kind of wow. sucked me in. And uh, over time, I just found that I was so comfortable sort of immersing myself in these stories from the past. But now, to kind of show you how these two rivers sort of converge, on the other hand, I come from a family of storytellers mm. and if you ever spent time either thanksgiving or christmas in columbia south carolina in the family room at my grandparents house you would hear some of the most amazing stories mm. but what sort of set in motion my life's work and carl's life's work was finding out some of the things that my grandfather engaged in, in particular, his time in World War II. Wow. So I mentioned earlier 
of Command Sergeant Major Olin Dorsey and his connection to the 24th Infantry. But growing up, we found out probably in high school, um, we found out, or I found out in high school, my brother is uh, five and a half years younger than me, that my grandfather served in World War II. Mm. And he started telling us these amazing stories. Mm. And I mean, you know, he, he boxed while he was in the service. He uh, was transported on the Queen Mary. Mm. Uh, he recalls uh, being in France. And the thing that used to, that sort of sparked my interest, Mike, when we were growing up, and I fully didn't understand everything then, but now that I've had chance to take classes and write papers and do research, and, and I, I taught at Payne College for over 20 years, doing all that, now understand that statement and sort of its impact. He used to tell us, he said, yeah, you know, when I was in World War II, I stayed at the hotel that Herman Goering stayed in. Mm -hmm. I said, like, what? And I kept thinking to myself, okay, you know, granted just talking, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever. Well, lo and behold, about 16 years ago, I was rummaging through the utility house at my grandmother's house in Colombia, And lo and behold, I found a photo of my grandfather in France, standing in front of a bed and breakfast or a hotel mm. with other African-American GIs. And it, all, it just brought that statement all back to me. And then my brother and I started talking and and he said, like, yeah, you know, granddad used to tell me these stories growing up. And it started painting a picture of a very vibrant career as a soldier drafted, an African-American soldier drafted during World War II. Then, Mike, we found out that it wasn't just granddad, mm. that we had four other relatives that served during World War II, mm. uh, four in the Atlantic and one in the Pacific theater. So... These stories that have been told to us all these years in our family, um, it just piqued my curiosity because I kept thinking to myself, if our family has these type of stories, then there are other families that tell the same types of stories as well. And so um, I've been hooked mm. ever since. And I just really love what I do. Mm. That's amazing, man. Like how everything comes full circle and it's interesting how if we are open to looking back, we can also get a path forward. So mm -hmm. you looking back were the stories from your relatives, from your grandfather, from you know, your, your uncles and, and things of that sort, from your father, your mother, the stories that you garnered from them literally led to your path forward in a sense that you are the historian at the Lucy Craft Laney Museum in Augusta, Georgia. And so it's, 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 inter it's, it's interesting how we do that. And that's part of my inspiration for reaching out to you. The other part for reaching out to you was, you know, I was listening to an interview with, a, it was a conversation with Dr. Greg Carr and Karen Hunter. And it happens every Saturday and it's called Carr's Class. And yeah. Dr. Carr was talking about black history. And he mentioned, he said, Silas X Floyd in Augusta, Georgia. And he <laughs> something. He mentioned the name, and I was just like, Silas X. Floyd. I remember my mom said that name because my mom went to Silas X. Floyd Elementary School. That's and my right. grandmother taught at Silas X. Floyd Elementary School. And right. so then I went online, and I saw Silas X. Floyd. I read a little Wikipedia, and it said that he went to Ware High School. And I was like, I ain't never heard of Ware High School. Then I looked, and I saw Ware <laughs> High School was the first high school in Georgia for African Americans. And I was just like, hold up. So you were the first person I reached out to. I was like, Corey, tell me something about this because I ain't never heard of this before. And you hit yes. me back with all kinds of articles or whatever. Yeah. And the light bulb went off. I was like, you know what? I got to have a brother on to talk about our history. Because like you mentioned before, it's either not been told in its full scope or it's been misappropriated, misinterpreted, or um, or misused. So, <laughs> and 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 my and you're you're absolutely correct. And, and the other word I'll throw in there is underappreciated. Yes. And 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 not and not necessarily um, from other communities. Mm -hmm. I think even as African Americans, we often underappreciate our own history. Mm. Um, we we tend to focus on what's on the surface and not do the deep dive that should be done. Mm -hmm. uh, or 
we relegate our history to academic circles. Mm. So you have people in academia who know about these stories, mm. who do the research, but the general population may not know. And I often think what sources of pride and what sources of inspiration that we could glean from studying the history and the life's work of some of these people. Now, you mentioned the Reverend Silas Xavier Floyd. Yes. And let me just say this, Mike, because I don't want your, you know, I don't, I don't want your listeners to, to think that I'm coming off as being this, you know, high-minded individual who's known all this history ever since I came out the womb and all this and all that. Uh -huh. I'll be honest with you. I mentioned earlier that uh, I have my roots in South Carolina. I, I've mentioned Columbia, South Carolina mm -hmm. several times. Well, growing up, I rarely spent holidays in Augusta. I've yet to spend a Christmas in Augusta, and I'm 47 years old. Mm -hmm. And so my roots run deep in Charleston and Columbia. Ooh. So it wasn't until I was in graduate school that I really fully began to paint that picture of what Augusta was all about. Mm -hmm. And I went over one Friday evening to interview a, a fraternity brother of ours, Dr. James Carter the mm Third, -hmm. and I was doing an internship, and I went over to interview Dr. Carter, and here I am thinking, Mike, not not you know what I'm thinking, bro. It's mm -hmm. a Friday evening mm -hmm. in the middle of the summer, mm -hmm. six o'clock. I'm going in do an hour interview, and I'm breaking out so I can go and and <laughs> have a good time. Yeah, yeah. Well, about three and a half hours later. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that's how it happens. <laughs> and that's how it happens. Dr. Carter, really, what he did was he set in motion the, the building of the foundation for me. This was the summer of 1998. Mm -hmm. And he, he set in motion the building of the foundation. And from there, he gave me the names. Mm -hmm. And that's all I needed. Mm -hmm. C.T. Walker. Silas X. Floyd, Ursula E. Collins, Lucy Craft Laney, T.W. Josie, A.R. Johnson, Peter H. Craig. Now, to your ears, Mike, I know what you're saying. Schools. Okay, you just <laughs> rattled off almost half the schools yep. in Augusta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. But the double importance of those names is that they're all significant names, not just for Augusta history, not just for Georgia history, but in the case of Silas Ford or C.T. Walker or Lucy Craft Laney, they transcend Georgia history. They had a national platform. Mm. So here we are in Augusta, Georgia. Over half the schools are named for African Americans. Mm. And these African Americans all contributed in some way, shape, or form. Now, Silas Floyd was one of those unique individuals. He was a man who wore, Mike, I don't know how he wore so many different hats mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. during his lifetime. He was an educator. He was an administrator. He was a poet. He was an author. He was a historian. Uh, he was the founder of a, of a newspaper column. Uh, he was uh, the second pastor of the historic Tabernacle Baptist Church in Augusta. He became very close friends with the Reverend C.T. Walker, who's the founder of Tabernacle mm. Baptist Church. So, so Floyd did so much. And I want to I wanna call to your attention one specific thing that he did that we can sort of flesh out and talk a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But um, Floyd did something that, at the time, obviously was done in part because of the Jim Crow statutes mm -hmm. that, that Southern society was living under. Actually, American society was just more codified in the South. Mm -hmm. But Floyd became the founder and editor of a weekly column in the Augusta Chronicle newspaper called Notes Among the Colored. Mm. And this started in 1915 and lasted in some variation for the next 50 years. Notes Among the Colored? Yeah. So, wow. so that, that was sort of the original name, Mike. 
but it went by different names throughout the year. So sometimes it was called News Among the Colored, and then they obviously replaced colored with Negro at some point or another. But for research purposes, for someone like myself or even someone like you, Mike, who want, maybe, maybe Mike, one day you want to do a deep dive into your family history. You know, maybe you want to do a deep dive into Mother Trinity CME Church, for example. Mm -hmm. You can go to the online archives of the Augusta Chronicle mm. and just plug in certain keywords, and it's going to pull up all the data you need from notes among the color. Wow. Names, names that have been forgotten in Augusta's past. Those names will once again come alive for you. Mm. Floyd was everywhere, and he maintained this column from 1915 until his death in 1923. He died two years after his best buddy, C.T. Walker, who died in 1921. Mm. Um, uh, Floyd died in 23. And during that time frame, Mike, he crafted this column to allow people to understand the multi-layered community mm. that he lived in. See, what I want people to understand about not just Augusta's Black community, but other cities as well, in spite of legal segregation, mm -hmm. these African-American communities not just survived in many instances, but they were able to sustain themselves at a level that was pretty, um, was, it, it showed a level of accomplishment. Cool. Um, there, were, there were so many black businesses in the area and Floyd wrote about those businesses. He talked about uh, the nationally renowned Pilgrim Health and Life Insurance Company. Mm. Uh, Floyd wrote about the preeminent theater that your your, your parents and grandparents probably talked to you about the Lenox Theater. Mm -hmm. He talked about the Burris Sanitarium. Yeah, there was a black hospital mm -hmm. in Augusta. He talked about the Penny Savings and Loan Bank. Yes, mm -hmm. there was a black bank in Augusta. Mm -hmm. Black theater, black insurance company, black bank, black hospital, black schools, black churches. Despite Jim Crow, these neighborhoods were able to coalesce, come together, and work for the betterment of their race, despite what the United States said their place was. Hold they on, chose hold on. another path. Hold on, dude, let me, I'm gonna tell you what's so powerful about what you're saying. Again, my heart is connected to Augusta because we can go back four generations to the Augusta area, but you highlighted something there which is extremely important. Because you mentioned that C.T. Walker passed in 1921 and um, uh, uh, Silas X. Floyd passed in 1923. We also know in 1921 something huge happened, Tulsa riots, right? The burning of Black Wall Street. And what's interesting, all the things that you mentioned, Black theater, Black bank, Black high school, I mean, uh, Black hospitals, um, I mean, all of these things in totality within the community, this complex multi-layered society within the black community, we tend to only highlight Black Wall Street. We tend yeah. to only highlight Tulsa, the Greenwood District, whereas once we have conversations like this, and we're talking specifically about Augusta, Georgia, which is a smaller area, smaller than Atlanta, which kind of gets overlooked at times, like you mentioned, like before Charleston, Savannah, and Atlanta, we need to highlight that there were examples like this all throughout America of exactly. these types of communities. Exactly, Mike, you, you're spot on. And especially between 1919 and 1939, where you have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of African-Americans leaving the South and moving to the North and to the West, what we often refer to as the Great Migration, mm -hmm. uh, you now have that piece of Southern history and culture that's now being transplanted to other parts of the United States. Mm. So those same types of communities that you have in the South, you also have in Detroit, Michigan. Mm. Those same type of communities that you have in Tupelo, Mississippi, you also have in Chicago, Illinois. So they're all over the place. 
and these people are taking their business savvy with them. Mm -hmm. They're taking their food, their, their, their cooking, their culture, their language, their lingo. They're taking all of this with them to other parts of the United States. But to your point about sort of these enclaves of black entrepreneurship, as I like to call them, yes, Greenwood is probably the most pronounced example because of the extent of the wealth in Oklahoma, but also because of what happened to it and Absolutely. what we remember about what happened. However, here in Augusta, for example, to give you sort of a smaller version of Black Wall Street, the Augusta area that I've been referencing thus far was often referred to by many as the Golden Blocks mm -hmm. of Augusta. And it was because of this uh, concentration of Black wealth through the various business ventures uh, created by many African-American entrepreneurs. Uh, I previously mentioned the Pilgrim Insurance Company. Well, Pilgrim was founded at 1741 Milledgeville Road here in Augusta, Georgia. That was the home of the Reverend Thomas Jefferson Hornsby, who at the time was the pastor of a church in Augusta called Antioch mm. Baptist Church. Hmm. He and his family members in 1898 pooled their resources hmm. and established a company that by World War II was one of the leading insurance agencies in the United States. As a matter of fact, don't take my word for it. Take Ebony Magazine's word for it. Because in the 1950s, Ebony Magazine did a profile on Pilgrim Insurance. And they said it best. The company with $2.50 in 1898 is now worth $8 million in 1948. Ooh. So that gives you an idea of that driving force. And you know what, Mike, let, let me take one step back. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put one foot in the previous generation and then I'll bring it back to the 1900s. Okay. I often think that one of the driving forces behind our forefathers and mothers being this industrious is the fact that for generations, you had a segment of the American population telling them they couldn't be industrious. Mm. So if I am telling millions of people, I am not going to give you the opportunity to read and write. If you're telling millions of people, I'm not going to let you create your own agency. I'm not going to let you create your own businesses. Well, then what do you do after 1865? <laughs> you establish thousands of schools from Florida to Philadelphia to New York. The, the birth and rise of the HBCU, the Historically Black Colleges and Universities. Mm. What else do you do? You begin to create a measure of wealth in your own community. Mm. So I have to think that the driving force was that people told them for so many generations, mm. you can't do this. You can't do that. Well, you know what? Once you get out of my way, I'll be able to do this mm. and that. And so by the early 19th, 1900s, you have these communities, um, Sweet Auburn Avenue in mm -hmm. Atlanta. Um, you have Washington Street in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, in Augusta, there was no such street name as Laney Walker Boulevard. It did not exist mm -hmm. at that time. So if you talk to some of the old heads in Augusta, you would want to reference Campbell and Gwinnett Street. Mm. The confluence of Campbell and Gwinnett, was the, that was the backbone of that business district. Now, for your listeners today, Campbell Street would be James Brown Boulevard mm. or 9th Street. And on May 31st, 1976, one of our fraternity brothers, President Emeritus of Morehouse College, Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, came to Augusta, Georgia, and from the pulpit of Tabernacle Baptist Church, rededicated Gwinnett Street as Laney Walker Boulevard. Wow. In honor of Lucy Craft Laney, the founder of the Haynes Institute, and the Reverend C.T. Walker. Thus the name Laney Walker Boulevard. Mm. Man. <laughs> Fellas, I hope you're paying attention. Again, 
he's going deep into Augusta history. But if you're mindful and you're kind of listening to the crumbs he's dropping, the Augusta history is not just Augusta history. It's Georgia history. It's not just Georgia history. It's American history. And it's not just American history. This is world history, right? If we really kind of put it in the proper context, all of these things happened here, but they influenced everywhere over there. And we're not limited to just history in Augusta, Georgia. And that's one of the things I wanted you all to realize. If we know from whence we came or where we came from, if we know where we came from, we have a clear idea of where we can go. And when we think about scenarios in which, you know, you think about possibilities, when you think about, you know, what I want to do with my life and how I want to impact the world, you know, if you kind of have some brain fog, take a step back and look back. Because like Corey mentioned, we were told for generations, you can't do this. And what happened when they got out the way? We did it. Well, you know, Mike, uh, one thing you mentioned, you brought up, and uh, I, I just have to, I just have to say this uh, uh, while I'm on, about why I have your attention. Mm -hmm. um, Augusta, even though we're the second city in Georgia, uh, from a foundation perspective, Savannah is much is a little bit older than us. We are also, but we're also the city of a lot of firsts, mm -hmm. and so. Um, there's a church in Augusta that uh, if your listeners sort of post pandemic, when everyone's sort of moving around freely again, and y'all want to come and visit me in Augusta and, and, and tour the city, I'd be more than happy to, to do a tour for, for all the listeners today. But um, there's an area that I often take people to called the, well, what, what, what was once called the Springfield village. Mm -hmm. And the Springfield village was a community of African Americans that lived near the Savannah River. And that village grew up around a church. This church was established in 1787. Mm. This is a colonial era established African-American church, one of the oldest African-American Baptist churches of continuous service in the United States, mm. Springfield Baptist Church. So to make that connection, Earlier, you mentioned Ware High School. So Ware High School was established in this village uh, post-Civil War. And um, I often found it interesting. Ware High School was named after Edmund Asa Ware, who is connected to Atlanta University, today mm -hmm. Clark Atlanta University. The first headmaster of Ware High School was Professor Richard R. Wright, who was a graduate of Atlanta University. Who were his classmates at Atlanta University? Henry O. Flipper, who would become the first African-American to graduate from West Point, who was one of his other classmates, William Sanders Scarborough, one of the most noted linguists of the late 19th century, who was his other classmate, Lucy Craft Laney. Wow often referred to as the mother of the children of the people in Augusta, the noted educator. Richard R. Wright would leave Ware High School, Mike, and would become the first black president of what's today Savannah State University. Wow. So you can see how all of these things are interconnected, but I need to also tell your audience one other thing mm -hmm. about Augusta, because we're not only the home of many first, we are, we're the birthplace of many significant schools in the United States. One in particular, in 1867, the associate pastor of Springfield, um, Reverend William J. White, established a school called the Augusta Baptist Institute mm. in 1867. Your audience will know that same school as Morehouse College in Atlanta, wow. Georgia. Wow. So Morehouse was established not in Atlanta, but in Augusta, Georgia in 1867. Mm. And then it moved to Atlanta in 1879. Mm. So, uh, yeah, Augusta has a lot to be proud of, especially the African-American experience in Augusta. It's so rich. It's so cultivating. And... Um, I got to say this. Mm -hmm. You mentioned sort of the international flair. Mm -hmm. I did C.T. Walker a disservice earlier in your segment when I referred to him as having a national presence. That's almost, that, that's only half the story. 
C.T. Walker in the late 19th century took a three month leave of absence from his church in Augusta and traveled the world. He went to the Middle East, he went to Europe, he spent an entire month in London, England. And by the time he got back to Augusta, people began talking about, white and blacks began talking about, quote, this young colored minister from Augusta, Georgia, traveling the world over. And he became known to many people as America's Black Spurgeon, mm. named for the 19th century theologian Charles Spurgeon mm. out of England. And he became this international star. Mm. And so C.T. Walker had international acclaim. Shoot, W.E.B. Du Bois actually highlighted the Haynes Institute while he was in Paris, France mm. one year. So Augusta goes far beyond just a national profile. These African-Americans were able to succeed despite the backdrop of Jim Crow. Dude, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's interesting. When I introduce myself on the beginning of this podcast, I say, I'm Mike Dorsey, Mr. Double Down on You, right? And Double Down on You is my personal development protocol. And it literally starts with helping brothers and sisters develop the courage and the confidence to double down on who they authentically are, right? I say courage and confidence. Confidence is because of, courage is in spite of, right? Confidence is because of, courage is in spite of. So when you think about confidence, you have confidence in something because you've already done it or because you have some reasonable you know, expectation that you can do it because you, know, you got some kind of proven history there, right? Courage is in spite of, meaning you might not have any backdrop or data to show that I am capable of this, but in spite of, I'm going to move forward. And so when you say courage, when I say courage and confidence, and when I hear you talk about the successes that we've had in spite of, or despite, despite you know, the, the challenges and, and all that that were faced, you know, to our, our ancestors, I think about the word courage. And brothers, this is Black Fathers Now, so we're speaking to Black men we have to embody courage in our actions. You might not have, you know, all the steps laid out. You might not have a body of work to pull from, but if you look back at your history and you see what these brothers and sisters were able to accomplish, they embodied courage and they were able to do something because remember, courage is in spite of. We have to embody courage as we move forward and as we impact the world. That's a, that's a great point, Mike. I think that Lucy Craft Laney is the perfect example of someone who embodied the example you just gave. Um, most people, let me say this to your, your audience, most people think of Lucy Craft Laney as the preeminent educator. And um, to give just a little background, uh, she was born in Macon, Georgia, one of nine children born to the Reverend David and Louise Laney. Um, David was a carpenter, purchased his freedom out of Sumter, South Carolina, moved to Macon, Georgia, became the pastor of Washington Avenue Presbyterian Church. There are Laney's that still go to that church still to this day. Uh, Miss Laney graduated in the very first graduating class of Atlanta University, uh, taught in Savannah, Georgia, came to Augusta and established a school named after a, a fellow Presbyterian benefactor by the name of Francine Haynes thus the name the Haynes Normal and Industrial Institute, which lasted from 1886 to 1949. Um, the current school, Lucy Craft Laney High School in Augusta, sits on the grounds of what was once the Haynes Institute. But that's not what I really want you to know about Miss Laney, to kind of connect it back to what you just um, talked about, Mike. Miss Laney was also the driving force behind the establishment of the Augusta branch of the NAACP. Mm. So every day I come to work at the Lucy Laney House, which is now the Lucy Laney Museum, I walk into an establishment that once held about 30 or so individuals on a day in February of 1917. Miss Laney calls a meeting of a who's who of prominent Augustans. These are professors from Payne College in Augusta. These are African-American doctors, African-American lawyers, postal mm -hmm. workers. They meet to form 
the Augusta NAACP. The national NAACP actually sent to Augusta a name that's probably familiar to many in your audience, James Weldon Johnson. Mm. So James Weldon Johnson, who most people know of from Lift Every Voice and Sing fame, at the time was working in Harlem, New York, but he was personally recruited by Du Bois to be the field secretary for the NAACP. Wow. He comes to Augusta and helps to organize the Augusta branch of the NAACP. He then leaves Augusta and goes to other cities because it's almost like a Southern tour, if you will. He's in Albany, Georgia, Atlanta, Hmm. his hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, Savannah, Columbia, South Carolina. But while he's here in Augusta, he partners with the great visionary educator, Lucy Craft Laney, to establish the Augusta NAACP. And, Mike, to kind of kind of uh, uh, make you kind of laugh for a moment, he took a moment while he was here to have dinner with his college classmate and friend, Silas X. Floyd. Wow. So, so <laughs> they had full, full circle, full hmm. circle. So uh, it, it's often, as historians, we often laugh about that because Du Bois... The philosophy of Du Bois and the philosophy of Booker T. Washington sort of played itself out at a local level in all different cities, all over the country. Absolutely. And here in Augusta, Lucy Laney embodied the Du Bois progressive philosophy and C.T. Walker embodied the more moderate Booker T. Washington philosophy. Mm. So did Silas Floyd. He was more of a moderate Mm -hmm. person in terms of his uh, cultural and political temperament. Mm -hmm. But the notion that here was James Johnson, or as Floyd called him, Jimmy Johnson, because they knew each other so well, Mm -hmm. was here in Augusta establishing a very progressive organization, but still found time to break bread with his best friend. Wow. I think think about layers, right? When you talk, I'm, I'm hearing layers and I'm hearing complexity right? Not being complicated, but being complex. See, complicated has a negative connotation. And sometimes we talk about our history is complicated. No, 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 no. Our history is complex, right? Because complexity is okay. Complexity just, you know, indicates that we have layers. I mean, it's like pulling back layers, pulling back, you know, because as you pull, peel the onion, more and more start to reveal itself. And mm-hmm. as you mentioned, the, the you know, the W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington's philosophies com- colliding, in Augusta, that was everywhere, right? I mean, the like you mentioned, you mentioned it from a the more of a conservative and or moderate versus progressive philosophy, but even educationally, it was more of the, you know, the industrial model versus, you know, more the the arts and the humanities, so to speak, and looking at it from that perspective. And they those collided, but it's interesting, sometimes when things collide, they don't bounce off of each other, they mesh together. Exactly. Exactly. That 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 that's the crux of how I approach Du Bois in Washington Mm -hmm. and how I present it to my students and how I present it to those who ask me that question. I often capture them within a Venn diagram format Mm -hmm. and look at what makes them similar similar as opposed to what makes them different. Mm. There was so much overlap with these two individuals and To be honest with you, they were pretty cordial pre-1895 Atlanta Compromise speech, Mm -hmm. as is often referred to at the Atlanta Cotton Exposition. They they all ran in the same circles. Mm -hmm. All of these people knew each other. But I think that as politics and culture became more polarizing after Plessy v. Ferguson, then African Americans began to fall into different camps. But as historians and as uh, modern Americans looking back in retrospect, we must appreciate the fact that although they fell on two different sides of the same coin, they both had the same goal in mind. Their vision was to for uplift in the Black community. That, simply put, mm-hmm. Du Bois wanted it, Washington wanted it, C.T. Walker wanted it, 
Silas Floyd mm. wanted it. Lucy Craft Laney wanted it. Sometimes we go about it in different ways, but at the end of the day, to steal a political phrase, at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, which is better schools, mm -hmm. paved roads, better health care, places of worship. We want businesses to thrive. Mm. We want all of the things that everyone else wants. Sometimes we just go about it in a different way. We have different Ooh. attitudes, you know, because we, we all grew up in different situations. That, that's, that's deep. And, and I'm going to throw one thing. And, you know, it's a concept. I, I um, read something at one point. It's really kind of stayed with me. It's the concept of unison, being in unison versus unity, right? Mm -hmm. See, unity is all about we're trying to get to the same place, but we don't always have to be in unison, meaning we don't yeah. have to adopt the same methodologies to get there. But we all have the same vision that we want this, you know, thriving society. Like everybody wants a thriving society within the community. We just all have different perspectives on how to get there. And sometimes we get so caught up in arguing about the perspectives or the routes to get there that we then lose sight of the ultimate goal of getting to this particular destination of this thriving, fully encompassed society. I, I fully agree, Mike. I, I think that... Um sometimes we can't get out of our own way of mm -hmm. success. We, we sometimes let personality mm. come into play. Um, you know, we, we let um, ego mm. come into play. Uh, and then, and then once those, once those elements are in the mix, um, sometimes it, it provides irreparable damage and we can't, you know, see eye to eye at least on the end goal mm. or, or the end game, so to speak. Um, you know, Mike, there was some, something that we've talked about a couple, a couple times already in the segment, and I wanted to kind of bring it up. Uh, I mentioned Ms. Laney's uh, civil rights activism, social activism, and uh, I talked a little bit about my grandfather's stories and your family stories and things of that nature. But I think one of the bigger pictures that has always propelled me and has always sort of... Uh, gained my attention when it comes to our forefathers and mothers was that these communities that they lived in did not make them complacent. Mm. They were always striving to be better people and to take some of that, that, that notion of being better, wanting better and passing it to the next generation. And the reason why I say that, that's the only reason I can think of that was sort of the driving force that would allow our grandfathers to go off and fight for a country mm. that was practicing legal segregation. Mm. Now watch this for a moment. The United States gets into World War II, December 7th, 1941. When we enter the Second World War, we are going with these high-minded ideals of eradicating fascism and Nazism from the world, yet we're doing it with a segregated army. Woo. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, usually when I teach World War II, I start off the conversation, or I title my lesson, The Double V Campaign. Mm. And uh, if you're familiar with that term, double V became sort of a rallying cry uh, throughout 1942 and, and a little bit of 1943. There was a, a, an African-American sergeant, I believe out of Kansas, who wrote an op-ed to the Pittsburgh Courier, African-American newspaper out of, Pitts, out of uh, Pennsylvania. And it was sort of a call to arms on two different fronts. Mm victory over the Axis powers, and victory over racism. Ooh. And the reason why I'm bringing this up at this, at this point is because these communities provided a measure of comfort and a level of success, but African Americans were never satisfied until full citizenship could be achieved. Mm. And I think that World War II was definitely the catalyst for the modern civil rights movement. Mm. I teach it a little bit different, Mike. A, a lot of 
a lot of uh, teachers, especially at the middle school, high school level, start with King, start with Rosa Parks, start with the Montgomery Bus Boycott. I tend to think of it as 1945. Mm. Black soldiers coming back from Europe and the Pacific with a different attitude and a different mindset. Mm. And that was sort of the catalyst for the modern movement, which obviously we're still having to grapple with certain issues even to this day. So I made, I made, simply made that point to say that Lucy Laney and C.T. Walker and Booker T. Washington and Du Bois, they did their thing for their era, mm. but they didn't keep it inside. They paid it forward. And then when they paid it forward, that next generation went off to war mm. between 1941 and 1945. But when they came back, they didn't internalize it. They paid it forward. And they led that led to the rise of the Kings and the Abernathy's or if you hear in Augusta, that would be Reverend N.T. Young and Reverend C.S. Hamilton and those individuals who led the modern civil rights movement in Augusta, Father Turner Morris at St. Mary's Episcopal Church. And so we as a group need to continue paying it forward. It's mm. not enough just to exist. Woo! Brother, it's not, fellas, it's not enough just to exist. And Corey also dropped a gem. It's bigger than just this. This is a global thing. This is not just Georgia. This is not just the United States. This is global. And you dropped something about how a lot of people start, you know, highlight the start of the civil rights movement to be the 50s or, you know, the going into the 60s. But you take it back to World War II and we can connect the dots here. And this would take us down another rabbit hole. But what's interesting, you connect the civil rights movement in America or then the United States of America, and you connect the dots to the liberation of colonized places throughout the continent of Africa and the Caribbean, because they all coincided around the same time. So you had the scramble, of Af scramble for Africa in the 1880s, which then led to all of Africa outside of Ethiopia and Liberia being colonized. But then you get to the 1940s and post World War II, Europe was decimated. So therefore a lot of their, the European powers were no longer powers, didn't have the resources to, in essence, manage these colonies in Africa and throughout the Caribbean. And then that was also the rise in some of us on the continent becoming more awake in our thinking. And it was like, okay, we want our freedom. But then the start to the civil rights movement as well in America, you connect the dots. And then you also had the tail end of some of the Pan-Africanist ideology, like with Marcus Garvey, which was connecting the dots to black people across the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's again, this thing is so deep. And when you start going down rabbit holes, you can spend the rest of your life focused on this, but it can also serve as inspiration of what's possible. I fully agree. Yeah, it, yeah. World War II is a wake-up call. Uh, I often refer to it as the most pivotal event uh, of the 20th century because it gave rise to so many things afterwards. And if you think about it for a moment, these European powers were using uh, colonized people to fight the war in many instances. So if I'm living in India or if I'm living in other countries in Southeast Asia and, and, and on the continent of Africa, and I'm going off to fight a war, for the liberation of a people, uh, I'm colonized. Mm -hmm. You're in my country. Where there, there's a level of hypocrisy there that you just can't get over. Mm. And so, definitely, that war became the springboard for many of those liberation movements around the world. And you start to see um, people begin to look at the world in a different light, begin to take a little bit of agency over their own lives and their own. Uh, resources in their own uh, country. And the same thing happened here in the United States. Um, those soldiers coming back um, from World War II became the catalyst for our modern movement. And one thing that I found so fascinating, when uh, Byatt Rustin and the others were organizing the March on Washington in 1963, one of the things that they did to keep a crowd that size, so organized, they used World War II veterans mm. because they had the experience. And so they organized, those sergeants organized them at the squad level. So 
to make sure that everybody was okay, nothing would break out. And that's why even though you had people like Strom Thurmond saying that there was going to be anarchy and rioting in the streets during the 1963 March on Washington, there wasn't one single incident because they were so well organized. Same thing happened in Augusta, Mike. Hmm. There was civil rights before the 1950s and 60s in Augusta. Obviously, I just told you about Lucy Laney. Mm -hmm. But it took someone like Reverend C.S. Hamilton, the pastor of Tabernacle, and Reverend N.T. Young, the pastor of Thankful in Augusta, to add a measure of leadership mm. to it. And then you sprinkle in there the students from Payne College, the only HBCU in Augusta. And when you put those two together, you have a powerful force because they are organized, they have solid leaders, and you have foot soldiers at the ready to do what's necessary to break down those barriers. Organization, leadership, and manpower. There you go. If you stop and you think about that, like that actually is a formula for success with any organization for this, from this moment going forward, organization, leadership, and manpower. Now, 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 bro, I'm going to tell you, I could sit here and talk to you all day and we might have to do it. Right. <laughs> Seriously, we might have to do a round two and hearing you talk, um, you need to be doing something routinely yourself. We'll talk more offline on that. Uh, yeah, I, we, 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 yeah, we'll chew it up. We'll chew yeah, it up. Yeah, because we, we, you, you, you're, you're dropping some gems. But before we leave, man, um, you mentioned that you're the historian at the Lucy Craft Laney um, Museum in Augusta, Georgia. How can folks get in contact with you, learn about the Laney Museum, um, connect with you, learn more about what you got going on? Just give all the tags and information for the brothers listening from all over the world to hear about. Sure thing. And, and Mike, I want to take a moment of uh, uh, personal privilege just to thank you once again for creating this platform, not just for me, but for uh, other uh, men, uh, other people to come on and talk about important issues in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I want to just thank you for doing that. And and I do hope that you invite me back at some point or another. Oh, you uh, coming I, back. I hope I, okay. All right. <laughs> you coming back. But, look, ain't, look, ain't no hope, nothing. You coming back. So <laughs> you know that. <laughs> well, well, Mike, um, the Lucy Craft Laney Museum of Black History is the largest African-American museum in the River Region. Mm -hmm. And when I reference the River Region to your, uh, your audience, I'm simply talking about the counties in Georgia and the counties in South Carolina that sit around Augusta, Georgia, near the Savannah River. Mm -hmm. So when we were growing up in Augusta, Mike, instead of here in the River Region, you probably reference this as the CSRA, as mm -hmm. the Central Savannah River area, but you'll often hear it touted now as the River Region, mm -hmm. which are the counties in and around Augusta, both in uh, South Carolina and Georgia. So we're the largest African-American history museum in this region of about 950,000 people. Um, we've been around now um, for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So this is our 30th anniversary okay. this year to find out some of the events that are going on throughout the, the course of 2021, you can go to our Facebook page at Lucy Craft Laney Museum. You can also go to our website, www.lucycraftlaneymuseum.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanna mention uh, one event that's coming up, a big event I'm excited about. Uh, last year, we did an exhibit called the HBCU Experience. Okay. Historically Black Colleges and Universities. And we wanted to connect HBCUs with Augusta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I mentioned during our, our talk that Morehouse was founded here. We've got Payne College here in Augusta. Which Ooh, was my, godmother, my godmother is the president of Payne College. Oh, yeah, okay. Cheryl Jones, yep. Cheryl yeah. Jones, yep. How about that's my that? godmother. Mm -hmm. I did not know. I learned something new every day, man. Yeah, you know. Yep, that's my godmother. Okay, okay. So well, one of my so, godmothers. I have three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I got to make sure I give a shout out. I have three godmothers, but one go. of my godmothers is the president of Payne College. So, <laughs> so I, I thought I was doing something because I have two godmothers. You got three. So you got I got the three. <laughs> you got the beat. You, you got you one got up, blessings, brother. You got blessings coming from everywhere. There you go. <laughs> So um, we're going to revisit the HBCU experience in February because 
back in October, we had a panel discussion of graduates of historically black colleges, um, Augusta natives, but we went to different HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And it was so well received. We're going to do a part two. It's going to be February the 19th okay. from 11 to 1230. And Mike, I'm going to send you the link okay. once we have the link ready so your listeners could uh, uh, view the virtual event. Okay. Uh, it will be, uh, it will be uh, moderated by one of our local media personalities, Miss Deidre Griffin, D. Griffin, mm -hmm. uh, went to Fisk University. So she'll be representing Fisk. And we're going to have a whole host of young ladies. It'll be an all-female panel. Mm. Uh, it'll be the HBCU panel experience called Ladies First. Mm. Queen La I'm going with it. Queen Latifah. Nope, love and uh, it. it'll be uh, young ladies representing uh, Morris Brown, Clark Atlanta, Payne College, Fisk University, Florida A&M, Howard Hampton, South Carolina State, and the list goes Albany State, Fort Valley. And uh, this is going to be so exciting. I cannot wait um, to see them chop it up and talk about that HBCU experience, that unique experience that goes back to the 1850s and we're still living with it today from Cheney and Lincoln University all the way to today, we are still living that experience. And so uh, I can't wait to hear them talk about that. And uh, we have some other events coming up and uh, I'll be happy to share them with you, uh, Mike, uh, and you can share them with your, your listeners in the future. Um, but, but thanks again, man, this has been awesome. This has been great. Bro, I really, I appreciate you, man. I really feed off of your energy and anybody who's listening to this, if you're listening to the audio or you're watching the video on YouTube, anybody who pays attention can see your excitement surrounding our history. And you are the type of brother that we need sharing our history because you're going to give it all to us no filter so that we can understand it, but you also give it to us in a way that we can take from it and apply it to our lives right now. Because the thing is, what is information? What are resources if we can't practically apply them to our life? And so I thank you for that energy. I thank you for your work. I thank you for your diligence. I thank you for spending your time with us today because I know some brother somewhere in the world then got something from this conversation. Man, you know, that, that makes me feel good, bro. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for, as from one cue mm -hmm. to another, thank you. No doubt. Thank you, thank you. No doubt, no doubt. Now, fellas, 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 ladies listening too, because y'all like to tune in to what we're talking about, make sure to visit Lucy Craft Laney museum.com lucy craft laney museum.com also follow the lucy craft laney uh facebook page so you can get more information and you can also learn more about Corey rogers the historian that you've heard talk for this time because this brother bring he you can see he brings some heat and he's loaded <laughs> with information so reach out to the lucy craft laney museum reach out to Corey specifically there let him know you heard about him on black fathers now and also pay attention to the upcoming hbcu panel february the 19th um, by the time we drop this beginning of February, we should have a link for you all to be able to click to so that you can go and check out the panel that's upcoming on February the 19th. Ladies first. So it'll be all ladies from HBCUs representing the Augusta area. Make sure to check that out. And as always, make sure to subscribe to Black Fathers Now. Give this episode a like. Share this thing out. Again, this is Black History Month. Again, to me, every month is Black History Month. Every day represents Black History Month. We're not relegated to just one month. But since it is Black History Month, we wanted to make sure that we share this information out there. Because, fellas, who are we if we don't know where we came from? And then how can we figure out where we're going if we don't realize the, the juice that's running, running through our veins, right? We got some juice, right? You know, we got vibranium running through our veins, you dig? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, yo, right. man, until next time, I really appreciate you for coming on. And, fellas, thank you for listening. Until next time, y'all be blessed well and wise, and I'll holler at you. Peace.